So that means everybody at home is also seeing that, or wherever they may be. So, um, I mean, I, at this point, I'm just going to say uh, welcome, folks, uh, for this evening. Uh, I think the session is going to run for about an hour. Um, and then we'll have questions at the end of the session. So there's a there's a, a, a questions area on your tabs that you'll be able to type questions into at the end. So don't worry, we don't turn the microphones on you at home or in your offices. You just get the opportunity to, to type in your questions for John. Um, so uh, so John's going to be covering off, uh, as I say, the the uh, how he shoots uh, fashion, boudoir, and, and, and the lighting elements that come into that. We're, we're also working in conjunction with uh, the Flash Center this evening. They have some special offers we'll be telling you about at the end of the evening, uh, amongst other things, because we also have some offers for you as well. So stick around for that and uh, enjoy the session. Uh, John, without any further ado, we, we can see your screen, so over to you, mate. I'll mute myself out for the time being. Okay, welcome to the show, folks. Thanks so much for logging in. Um, much easier than the last time we did this session. I think the last time we tried it, I was about an hour late to my own show. So this has been really, really smooth, so hopefully that bodes well for the rest of the evening. So if anybody was in doubt as to who we were listening to, um, the next slide is me. And that's me, uh, taken using just Speedlight, a Speedlight Outdoors uh, by one of the students on one of my courses. Um, not the best picture ever, but that's down to the subject matter rather than the lighting. But that's me. Who am I? For people who don't know me, well, I'm a full-time photographer. I'm based over in Beverley in East Yorkshire, beautiful area of the UK, and right out in the countryside, but very close to the city of Hull and other cities like Leeds and York. So it's a good place to be based. I work in the areas of art nude, boudoir, fashion and bridal photography. I shoot some private clients, but a lot of my time now is spent teaching. I could be a 100% teacher, but it's something I pull against and resist deeply. The reason being that I think I've got to keep it real. I could show you amazing pictures uh, of models that I, I, I take, uh, but that's kind of a little bit fake to my way of thinking, because the true nature of certainly being a wedding photographer is turning up on a wet and windy day at a less than inspiring location with a bride who's flapping a little bit maybe and running late and is you know really struggling to get the best pictures, but by using lighting and getting those images, we can really help our clients. The reason I love shooting boudoir for private clients is that a lot of my clients are not the 20-year-old models I work with. They're in the 40s, maybe, in the 50s. Life has lived with them for a few years, and they come to the studio, and they're a little bit nervous, they're a little bit reticent, but by using light, by using um, pose, by using the, sh the social soft skills of photography, we can really enhance their feeling about themselves. And it is phototherapy. For me, it is the best genre of all photography. I teach with the societies, I teach with Flash Center, and I work with Ellingcrom very closely. And I go all over, all over the world giving this message out now that art nude and boudoir photography is just the best genre to work in. And if you've never shot nudes, make this the year that you do it. You will learn so much about lighting and posing the human form. And it's just a fantastic genre. The one lesson I will give out, though, is that it's not all about Ellingcrom lighting. I use Ellingcrom. I love it. But... All the techniques we talk about today are equally as applicable for whatever kit you have, whether you're using speed lights, whether you're using Bowen's heads, whether you're using any other uh, bits of kit that you've picked up along the way. Don't worry. The message isn't go out and spend money. The message is go out and experiment with the kit you've got. Have a lot of fun. And any questions you've got, feel free to add them in as we go, and I'll try and answer them all by the end of the session. A lot of people ask me about what cameras I use. I use a Nikon D300. Now that may surprise you, it's not the biggest, it's not the best, it's not the latest addition to the Nikon range. Why do I use it? Well, because I paid good money for it, and it still works. And until it falls apart in my cold, dead hand, I am not going to chase the biggest and best to replace it. I've had a lot of fun recently using a Pentax 645Z medium format camera, 51 megapixels of raw camera information. A stunning piece of kit. But at the moment, would I buy it? No, because it wouldn't add significant value to my business. So I can't justify spending 30000 on a, a new camera kit. I use Nikon SB800s. Again, not the biggest and best of the Nikon Speedlight range, but they do the job. And again, until they break and stop doing the job, I'm not going to chase it. The, the Ellingcrum ELB Quadras, though, are a fantastic piece of light. 
they are a brilliant piece of kit that takes studio quality lighting indoors, outdoors, wherever I go, it goes. And it gives me that flexibility to shoot wherever I want to. And next week, we're going to be over in Portugal on the Algarve. Oh, my life is so shabby. Um, we're going to be shooting on the beaches out there. And even there in the noonday sun, when the Mediterranean sun is blasting down on us, we'll still be able to overcome it, override it, and keep detailing the skies and light our models. The Data Colour Spider. I love it. It's been a part of my working life since I first started in photography. Now recently we did a, a tour alongside the guys from a flash centre and it's called the 12 Lux Tour. We went all over the UK um, with this tour. And one of the questions that cropped up regularly was what the difference is between white balance and calibration? Because a lot of my stuff is done on weird white balances. I'll then it change from white balance in, on the computer later on to get different looks. And people were saying to me, well, why do you calibrate your screen if you're not bothered about the colour? I said, but I am bothered about the colour. I need to know that what I see on the screen is exactly what's going to be output when I print it or when I put it out onto a, um, an online display. And so the colour that's on the screen is absolutely critical. If I can then play with it by using alternative white balances and then bring it back onto the computer, that's when the spider earns its crust. So it's a fundamental part of my kit, and I do all my retouching on a little laptop. It's an old Toshiba laptop, but with an additional Acer monitor attached to it. And that monitor is brilliant. I can calibrate it within an inch of its life, and then the spider will match the laptop as near as it can get. So what I'm seeing on both screens is, is pretty much the same image. So vital piece of kit if you're working on two screens, upgrade from the basic package and I think Richard's going to tell you about the new studio kit that's just been launched last week um, which will certainly help with that. But the main message of there is don't be a kit freak. Get the kit that works for you. Get the kit that's going to earn money to your business. Get the kit that's going to be able to take the pictures that you want. And really when you start out use natural light. Natural light is my favourite of all lights. Finding a doorway and sitting somebody in it, so you've got nice flat muted light, perhaps putting a reflector underneath, and here you can see in Devon's eyes you've got uh, multiple catch lights from the reflector below, the light coming in from above, but look at the quality of that light. And this, should, this was shot on the Pentax 645, and you'll see the incredibly beautiful shallow depth of field, that it's rendering the eyes sharp, and yet even the hair is falling out of focus. Beautiful piece of kit, and again, just such a simple shot. Looking at the different angles, shot on a Nikon with a 70-200 lens this time, at f2.8. Again, a difference in the depth of field. It's not as shallow as the Pentax because of the different sensors involved, but that beautiful light, that little bit of movement in the hair. Even when we're taking static images, I like to get a little bit of movement in the hair. It drives your model crackers because if she's got a bit of breeze blowing on her face, her eyes are watering a little bit, so you've got to be quite sensitive to, to it. But here, if there's a little bit of breeze and we get that lovely hair movement and interaction. And changing the poses. If we're shooting for fashion, for boudoir, you can't just take one image and like it. All these pictures were taken in the same setup. It was a door to a restaurant in a hotel that we were working in, in Dublin, last week. Devon and I were over in Ireland, and the, the light on this particular day was spectacular, and it was just so beautifully muted. It, it was beautiful. So just working the angles. Here, I've got it to bring her shoulder around towards me and just tilt it forward so it's just really having to look over her shoulder. Now that's producing little neck creases and so by cropping in tight we've reduced that and again just making that connection between the peak of the chin and the top of the shoulder and the intensity then is the eyes. You look into those eyes and you just want to drown in them. Absolutely beautiful. Using negative space it's not all about the light. It's not all about the fun, fancy things that we can do in camera. We've also got to think about composition. And this is one where I've used the negative space over to the side that she's looking into. But she's not. She's angled her eyes back to the camera. Now, quite often, I say, don't have too much white of the eye showing in the image. But because I'm central to her, this image works. If I'd have been stood further over to the right, then she would have really been squinting at me with those eyes like Scooby-Doo's victim looks at when the monster's coming. It's like, yikes, here it comes around the corner. So by putting herself central, we've got the gaze 
looking at us, we've got the white of the eye just accentuating the shape of those eyes, and again, just the connection between the line of the point of the chin, the neck coming down to the shoulder, and it's all angling us right into looking into those beautiful eyes. Natural light and a reflector. The reflector I use is a silver reflector. Um, I don't tend to use gold because it makes people look a little bit umperish and can give real shine on the skin tone. The silver just adds a little bit of gloss and a little bit of punch. Um, this one is a California Sun Bounce. It's on a frame, which means I can just drop it on the floor nice and easy, and it just bounces the light in and lifts the shadows. Again, next week in the harsh sunlight, I'm really looking forward to using this out on the beaches to add some real punch uh, to the lighting um, on Devon. So watch out for some of those images coming through. When you shoot with natural light, don't just go for the first picture you see. Look for other options. I'd sat her in the doorway into this restaurant, but I was shooting through basically um, uh, the only brick wall to the side of it was a glass wall. Well, what better than to get Devon then out, lean her onto that glass wall, shooting along it, getting really close to that reflective surface so you get a beautifully strong reflection in there. Again, this is just natural light and a reflector. You check out the eyeballs and you can see the double catch light, one from the light source, one from the reflector. If ever you're in doubt as to what you're looking at um, on an image and how it's been lit, always zoom in tight on the eyeballs. There's usually a dead giveaway. I don't tend to retouch the light sources out of them. I don't mind having multiple light sources in there um, unless it's a total distraction. Uh, but here, zoom in tight and you'll be able to reverse engineer the shot and, and see how it was lit. Always looking around for different options. This, in a way, is another natural light shot, but it meant us searching for the light. We went into a hotel, and this wall fitting, this wall light fitting, was just crying out to be used. It was beautiful, not just for itself, but because of the light patterns it was casting against the wall. The first shot I took was this one, with Devon looking towards the camera, with her back to the light fitting. The light's a bit dominant in this shot. It's not as attractive as it could be. It's the brightest thing that you look at. Um, it's backlighting the hair beautifully and giving nice cross light to her, her body. But it's also giving those specular highlights in there and dazzles and odd little light flurries here and there. So it's not the most attractive of shot. We've got to work something different. By moving around a little bit, we get a much nicer image. I've turned her body slightly away from the light and brought her face back towards it. I've spot metered for the brightest portions of that light and got Devon as close as possible so that the light on her face was pretty much balanced by the light in the light fixture. What that means then is that the light itself isn't blowing out. We're getting some nice detailing across the skin tone, but more than anything, we've got that beautiful pattern of light vignetting around her and highlighting her form. By turning her body away from the light just slightly, we're getting the nice shadows across her chest, which is showing that she's a three-dimensional woman. Really important, if you're going to get into the boudoir world or shooting nudes of any description, is to understand how light and shade gives definition to body shape. If we just flat light somebody, as we were doing in the first images where we were just flat lighting Devon's face, then we can take away all those shadows. We can take away the shape of their breasts, of their musculature, and that may be desirable. But the minute we put light and shade, we're showing that we're working with a living, breathing, three-dimensional person, and that's really what we want to be doing. Stepping out of the hotel, and um, stepping actually a long way from that hotel because it's up in Belfast the next day. A sunny day, and I wanted that muted light, but I also wanted to use the nice sunlight that was coming through. And so we stepped Devon just under a, a little archway into a courtyard. By doing so, we put a face into the soft, muted light. But as you can see, her shoulders and back of her hair were still getting struck by this really hard sunlight. In effect, we've set up a free light setup because we've got rim lights on both sides of her. We've even got hair lights, you could almost argue it's a four light setup, but we've got, most importantly, we've got this beautiful soft light across the front of her face. How That was slightly enhanced. How was it enhanced? By using that silver reflector. Now, the silver reflector could have been put under a chin. That's where we'd uh, tend to get the, um, the standard position. We tend to 
uh, put the reflector under a chin and let the light reflect upwards. The trouble is in this instance, that would have given shadows rising upwards. It would have that hammer horror type effect. And so I got one of the delegates to hold the reflector above her. And you can see that in the catch lights in her eyes. If you hold that above her, and it's vertically above her, so it's almost touching the top of her hair, and it's held flat to her, it's not angled down. That's really important because then the light just bounces off the bottom edge of that reflector and still gives some modelling uh, to the cheekbones, still gives some modelling under the chin line, and drops that beautiful, soft, gentle light down on her. So even if you're out there in the wide open spaces and you're working with hard, hard sunlight, don't underestimate the power of just that reflector. That little tin foil on a frame can work in your favour to get some great, great light if you're just a little bit inventive with it. Okay, natural light can be beautiful indoors too. This is another shot from the Tour of Ireland, and we had the luxury of shooting in an old castle. Um, and it was only because the location we'd initially gone to, um, we'd used all the possibilities of it, and it was getting a little bit too crowded. And so the, the people who were the delegates that day just rang the castle on spec and said, would it be possible to shoot? And Ireland being Ireland, they said, yeah, come on over, not a problem, not a problem. So here's Devon sat in the piano room. And we've got the light coming in from the window that you can see on the right hand side, coming across her body. Really important, and I can't stress this enough. If you're wanting to highlight shape, get the light coming across the body. This would have been a really boring shot if we'd have turned her feet towards the window and just flat lit her. What makes it interesting is that beautiful piece of shadow down her cheekbone. The beautiful piece of shadow just highlighting her cleavage across her stomach, across her thighs. It's a boudoir type shot that most people could do if they were happy to get nude in front of you. And because nothing is revealed, then it's a very elegant shot that anybody could have in their, in their boudoir package. See the way the light wraps around her slightly. We've put a reflector also to the left-hand side of the image, and that's what's giving the catch light, or the highlight rather, just down the back of the hair there. So again, stop those shadows just being too deep on the back of the head, and just give a little bit of uh, detail in there. Also, when you're shooting, just think of the color palette that you're going to be using. There were a lot of different chairs in this room that we could have used, but I went for the one that had the white cover and was brown wood. Why? Because we were dealing with essentially white skin and brown, well, red hair. Couple that with the brown shutters in the background, the wooden shutters, the wooden floor, and the white light coming across them, and suddenly you got very complementary colour tones. If I'd have picked one of the red chairs or the green chairs that were in the room, that wouldn't have worked so well. So always think of every element in your image. Don't get thrown by the fact that perhaps your model is in the nude. Look at each element and think, does it work? And if not, change it. If not, crop it out of the image. If you can't change it or crop it, consider not shooting it. Okay, let's start having a look at a little bit of flash here. And... This is one of the simplest setups that I can advocate to you. Ignore the strip box if that's not being used. The light that's being used is for one in the top right corner, which is basically a quadra with a bucket attached to it. The bucket has a posh name. It's a maxi light. But you can do this with a single speed light, and it's a great shot to do if you've just got a white wall to play with. Now here, we're in a fantastic studio down near Chippenham. Um, that's normally used to shoot motor vehicles, and so it's a massive white scoop. But by using the single hard light source, backed off quite a long way, as far as we could, we were able to shoot the model and put the shadow in behind her. Remember what I was saying before about shadows and how important they are to the image? Here, it's the shadow as much as the pose of the body that makes the picture work. By shooting low and putting the light far back and moving away from the scoop, we've elongated the way the shadows works on her legs, um, and you see the way the torso is more or less the same size. Um, but playing around with the environment, getting that hard light in from distance. If I was shooting this um, with a speed light, I would put it to manual power, probably start off about half power, and put it as far back as I could, somewhere you know, about 12 feet away. That would then give me good 
hard light on my subject and a good hard shadow. Now if you've got a light meter, put the light meter on the subject, point the white bulb through to the um, flash and do a test shot. And that will give you the f-stop of the light falling on the subject. It's really important for me then to work in manual flash because if I'm working in TTL, I could get all sorts of different variations. So if I'm working with flash, I tend to work manually rather than TTL. Just because you're working with that hard light doesn't mean you can't get in nice and tight as well. It's very sympathetic um, to people's faces because it does fill in all the cracks. Now here's Devon. Again, we've got in nice and tight to her for a nice tight shot. Love the connection with the single eye that we can see. But look at that hard shadow around the edge of her, really defines her body shape. A beautiful form of lighting, very, very simple one. And as I say, it's one that you can do with just one light and a white wall. My studio is about the same size as a single garage. It's not the biggest of studios at all. One end has a, a grey paper and various backdrops. The other end is just a pure white wall. And we use that a heck of a lot for all sorts of different shots. And it's not the biggest of walls, it's about 12 feet across, but it's amazing how many different looks you can get in there. And you can even then extend the canvas even further in Photoshop later on. And that's a technique we'll talk about um, on another shot that's still to come. Hard light, and apologize for nudity um, here, but I don't make no apologies. This is what I shoot, this is what I do. This is a ring flash. It's another form of hard light source that's very fashionable, very funky. You'll see it a lot in magazines. And if you're shooting in the fashion way, I'd say get yourself a ring flash emulator that you can just ram onto um, speed lights if you've got them. Or if you've got something like the Quadras, then the Echo ring flash that sits on top of them is a beautiful piece of kit. And you see the way it gives a good slight glow to the skin tone. We've also got a couple of um, side lights on this shot to, to give form to Devon's edges and we've got the two glitter balls. We were working in a studio in Hertfordshire with a good friend of mine, John Applegate. He has all sorts of stuff in his studio and we found these glitter balls, just hung them from the ceiling using a bit of fishing twine. We used fishing twine because that is almost invisible to the eye when you shoot it and you can get rid of it very easily in camera. So make use of all the props you've got and don't be afraid to play with different light sources say ring flash in this instance. Using the same techniques of taking hard light, well here's Devon the Bride, um, again from a tour of Ireland, well this was a year ago, and we were over in Athlone and we went up onto the um, roof of the uh, boiler house, <laughs> which would you believe, it was a really really windy day and just out of shot to the left of the screen as we look, we have our makeup artist who was clinging onto that veil for grim death because otherwise Paul Devon would have been blown off that um, little top of the boiler vent and disappeared. What I loved here is the real geometric shapes and I really wanted to get the sun on the back of Devon and, and then use flash to highlight the front of her. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the angle right because of where the sun was and we didn't have time to wait for the sun to move around. As you see, the sun is what's catching the top of her head and it's just over her left hand shoulder. So it's blowing out the veil slightly. I've got a flash with that maxi light bucket on it just forward um, of her, again over to the camera left and blasting light in. To get this shot, I think I was working out F18, 200 ISO, 200 per second F18. And that, the, my flash was pretty much on full power to pound that light in on her and give detailing across her body and her face. Again, the rule of thumb, body away from the light, face towards it. That way you're getting the detail across her face and a little bit of shadowing across the dress and across the chest. Taking that same lighting setup, this time it's sunset. We're not having to work quite as hard um, with as much power. It's a case of taking a picture of the sky here and then putting a model in front of it and matching the flash to the exposure you took for the sky. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the sky here, that was the shot. I took a picture of that and made sure it was looking nice. Now, I can't remember the settings at all, but I'm guessing it came in somewhere around perhaps 60th of a second, f5.6. 
Once I've got that, that tells me that I need 5.6 worth of flash on my subject. And so I put the flash over to one side. 5.6 isn't a great um, amount of light. It's quite a, a, a large aperture. So you don't need that much light in there. So I'd probably have knocked the power down to something like a 64th if I was using a speed light, um, even lower on the quadras, and done a test shot. Have a look, see how it works, and then up and down your power from there. I'm a great believer in chimping. I believe that, yeah, use your light meter, but I tend to use that more indoors. Outdoors, I'll have a look. I'll have a look at the back of my camera and see how it looks. A great tip for you. If you color calibrate your monitors using, obviously, the Data Color Spider kit, then do a shoot one day. Keep the images on your memory card, download them onto your computer, then when you've done that, put the memory card back in your camera. Hold the camera up alongside your color calibrated screen and see how it differs. Because what you're seeing on the back of your camera is a JPEG. Even if you're shooting RAW, you're still seeing a JPEG version of the image that you shot. And that means that the camera is making various interpretations for you. But you've got all the control over that interpretation. So if it's looking distinctly different to what's on your screen, on your laptop or your computer, then go back into the camera and reset all the things that need resetting until your camera is looking as near as it possibly can to what you see on your computer screen. That way, you've got total confidence that when you're shooting outdoors or in the studio or wherever you're shooting, you can look at the back of the screen and go, yep, nailed it. I've got a great image there and I can move back on. So yeah, calibrate your screens, but also calibrate your camera to the screen by eye and by um, adjusting all the JPEG settings. Let's have a think about angles of light here. Angle of light is as important as the type of light you use. Now here, we can see that the starting point for this was about 45 degrees to our subject and angled down at her. How can we tell that? Well, look at that catch light. There's a giveaway. It's right in the top left-hand corner of her eye socket. And because she's facing straight towards me, we've got a little bit of shadowing down the inside of the nose. We've got the cheekbone on the right of the frame as we look in deep shadow. And we've got a nice catch light in the eyes, a nice light across the mask of the face. If we turn a faint nose into the light, then look how that nose shadow softens. It's still there, but it's, it's a lot softer and the sh cheekbone shadow is a lot softer. Much nicer image perhaps. And then we look at the catch light and see how it's moved across the eye. So it's been in the top left corner, it's now in the top right corner. And we've really softened the whole look on there. Best tip I can give you when you're shooting headshots with Studio Flash, if you've got a softbox on there, get it in as close as you can to your subject. The closer you've got the softbox to the subject, the better the quality of light you're going to get. And again, that's true whether you're using a speed light or whether you're using quadras or studio lighting. A lot of people ask me what is the best modifier to use when I'm working with speed lights. I'm a strong advocate of using a bounce brolly when I'm working with um, speed lights. The reason being that the speed light is a small compact light source that gives a really punchy light out of the middle of it. And so you can put it in a big soft box, but it's got a tendency just to punch right through the middle of it and still give you um, a, a shaft of light that's a little bit like hitting it with a lightsaber. Now, if you put that into a bounce brolly, the light bounces into the brolly and then rattles all around the inside of it and then comes back onto your subject. So you've got a much broader light source coming out of a bounce brolly than you have from shooting straight through a silk on a softbox. If you're working with something like the Quadras, then you're working with a 360 degree radial bulb. So that's why you get a much better quality of light from something like that or from studio lighting. Slightly different angle. You see we moved the light back um, over to the left of the subject and just tilting her head over, really maximizing the shadows. And again, the body's just turned slightly away to get that detailing across the face and across the um, torso. Play around with your angles. Don't just settle for one angle. Go for a split light pattern if needs be. Here, we've gone for a really dramatic effect, putting the light right over to the side of the model. So it's almost at 90 degrees to where I'm stood. And you see that it's just drifting across the nose, hardly anything, but just giving that little kiss, that little catch light in the eye to give quite a, a dramatic portrait. 
How about shooting into the softbox? Have your subject stand in front of it, letting that light then just wrap around your subject to give a really high key effect. Again, we're talking today about fashion, we're talking about boudoir. I use this look a lot in boudoir. I might put a, a light in behind a sheet to make a really um, big light source and shoot for, uh, through that and have the subject stood in front of the sheet and let the light just wrap around. And you see how that's doing this here on the model's face. How about rim lighting? Rim lighting, I think, is one of the most spectacular forms of light that you can learn because if you show um, a client off the back of their camera, they think it's some sort of voodoo magic and you're some sort of voodoo magician and you just bow to their applause and say, yes, I am. Stuff silver and gold in my pockets and um, I'm worth every penny. Here, we've got the light to camera left and it's angled straight back towards me. Maybe just slightly tilted towards the model, stop a lot of flare coming into the camera. But what we're working on here is the fact that light V-shapes out from its light source. And we're looking to hit those edges, the edges of light that just give you that little bit of rim along the edge of the nose, along the lips, and just that nice little catch light in the eyes, and that little V of light um, just coming down from the eye on this dark side. We can use this in lots of different ways. If you're working with a nude model, if you're working with a lingerie model, and you really want to highlight form, rim lighting can be your all-time favourite. Here um, we have a boudoir shot in lingerie, and we've used the rim light, just a single light source, just to highlight the buttocks and give a great look. Quick tip here, if you're modelling, you want to get as much curve in those cheeks as you possibly can. If you get your model to stand tall and then just push the backside back a little bit, put in weight down whichever leg gives best form um, to the buttocks and experiment. Put weight on the left side, put weight on the right side. See how it changes and then take the shot. This as a nude image is one of my top sellers in my world of boudoir. Most of my clients will buy a shot like this because they love the light that it gives. And everybody has something that they can be proud of. And because people don't often look at their own backsides, um, it may be the first time they've seen it. And they can look at it and say, ha, 50 years on, but I'm still hot. And we can do that for our clients. So great, great lighting. Learn rim lighting. And it's all about the angles. Okay, here's another one light shot for a little bit of boudoir effect. We were in what was quite a bland room uh, in a conference center, and yet this extraordinary light fitting um, really dominated the scene, and so I really wanted to use it in the shot. So I was trying to work out how to do it, and I thought, okay, let's use it as a background. To use it as a background meant, first of all, elevating Devon. She was stood on a chair. Now, it was a fairly wobbly chair, I have to say, and so she was very brave for standing up there. Um, normally, I would have asked the client just to bend the knee nearest the camera to put more stress on that thigh. But here, she was having all on balancing, and I thought, if I ask that, she's going to kill me. I was also asking her to lean forward from her waist slightly. The reason I do that is if I'd have got a stood straight up, she would have had converging verticals. And if you give a, a model a wide base and a tiny little peak, then we've got a thin head and a big bump, and we're not going to thank you for it. And so by leaning over from a waist, we've got to just to correct that perspective slightly. Now to get this image, it's similar to the techniques I talked about when I was taking a picture outdoors with the sky. I took a picture of the light fitting first. That gave me the exposure that I needed, and it told me that I was going to be working very slow. I think it was about 15 to the second, about 400 ISO, um, and wide open on the aperture. So I knew that I didn't really need much power out of my flash. So I put a flash on a stick up to the um, camera left. It was on a soft. It had a soft box over the front of the quadra, and that was giving beautiful soft light. And you see the catch light in Devon's eyes. And I backed it off because I wanted the fall off of light to be fairly consistent from her head to her backside, and then just starting to fall off um, as it hit the top of her thigh. So again, if you're shooting these images, experiment with the power, experiment with the distance of the subject, back your light off slightly, pull it forward slightly, and just look at not just the quantity of light that hits your subject, but where it starts to fall off. I wanted her hair to be a prime feature of this, and so we swept it all over to the far side, turned her body again just slightly away from the light, and then turned her face right back into it. Now this is quite an awkward pose to pull off, um, but it, thought it really worked this time, and I love that light fix, uh, fixture as a backdrop. 
Okay, taking the um, single light source outdoors. Where do we put a single light source? Generally, I'll put it off into the side of a subject and try and get the sunlight behind them. Now here we had a kind of day where the sun was playing peekaboo, running and hiding behind the um, clouds, and we were really struggling. Haley Blesser was sat on this um, fence. She wanted to do a pin-up styling shoot, and she got this fantastic outfit. And so she was sat there. The wind was howling around us, and I'm saying, "No, just hang on there, hang on there, hang on there a little bit longer." But I've got the flash in one hand, uh, hang, desperately hanging onto the light stand to stop it falling over. And I'm trying to get the um, exposure. The exposure I took was for the sky. I took a picture of the sky. That gave me, I believe, it was about f16. I made sure that when I was taking that picture of the sky, I didn't have the sun in the image. If the sun had been in that patch of sky, then it would have boosted the f-stop up to about f22 and totally skewed it. I didn't want that. I wanted the sky to look moody, but not to be so black. Um, uh, that all you could see was the bright sunlight. So took the exposure off the sky. Once I'd got that, adjusted the flash until it was giving me the same amount of power on, on Haley. And then one-handed, we were taking the shots on about an 1870 lens. So it's a fairly wide lens, fairly close to her, and, and really battling the elements. But I think you'll see it was worth the effort. To get out of the wind a little bit, we moved into the field. Now. I always say to people, and one of the questions that I get is, where do you get your inspirations from? And my answer to that is, a lot of the inspirations we get can almost be subliminal. I try and expose myself to as many different influences as possible. I watch movies, I read magazines, I read books, I watch pop videos, I look at images, I look at paintings, I look at sculpture. And it was only as I was shooting this um, set that I suddenly remembered Jane Russell in the film Gypsy. And this to all intents and purposes, our inspiration, because the looks, the style, the vampishness, um, particularly in some of the later shots you'll be able to see later on my blog, they really do reflect that, that movie. It wasn't a conscious um, homage to that film, but it really did reflect that sort of style. So yeah, get your inspirations from wherever you can, and, and don't be afraid to, to use them. Just another form of soft lighting. Here's, again, you see the catch light in Haley's eyes. We wanted to use the golden colours of a skin tone and the golden colours of the haystack. Mix that with blue and you get a nice strong contrast for uh, fashion. Again, something that's a quick win for shooting funky pictures is think of a colour wheel. Look at colours that clash, look at colours that complement, look at colours that can accent. Uh, start to read into colour theory and it will really help you style your shoots, picking out the right elements to work. Here, we've very definitely got the sun on her back. If I'd have metered for the sun on the haystack, she would have been pretty much into deep shadow. And so I just used a single flash um, from camera left, just angled right down, giving some shadowing down with a mask of her face and just a little lift um, so that she wasn't a pure silhouette against that hot sunlight. Okay, just a couple of um, little um, lighting diagrams. Uh, to finish off with. Here we have our model and you can see that the main light is to camera right and that's a beauty dish. Now again a beauty dish is the type of light that will work up to a point with a speed light. Why? Because it's got a little disc in the middle that the light hits and then bounces back into a bigger dish, rattles all around there and then projects out onto your subject. I've teamed that with a soft box um, that was angled in vertical orientation, so portrait orientation, and the soft box is giving that little rim of light just drifting around the edge of the cheek, and the um, beauty dish is really carving into her features, giving great shadow, not just on the face, but on the torso, and this sort of agonized expression um, we felt went with the very vintage looking makeup. Just moving that setup just slightly, and you get this look. We've got a beauty dish in front now, the soft box behind, and as you can see from the catch light under the eyes, there's a reflector just balanced more or less at breast level, just reflecting the light back in. Makes for a beautiful high key shot. It's a mix and match of a lot of the different images that you've seen so far in the in the talk. And it's using the soft box as a backdrop and getting the beauty dish in on the front and then lifting any shadows with the reflector. Again, hard light. I love hard light. So often we look for soft light in our images, but hard light down a 
the face here gives great cheekbones onto the model and the light behind just catches the cheekbone, just catches the jawline and the back of the hair. Again, using the softbox as a high key background, using the beauty dish as a key light, the reflector underneath. These are all shots you can do with one and two lights. I wanted to keep it simple tonight. I wanted to give you a few ideas that you can go out and hopefully shoot tomorrow. I know some of the people who are logged in are coming with us to Portugal next week. We'll be using these um, styles out and about as we go around the, the beaches in the town of Tavira. And hopefully um, you'll be able to see some of the pictures coming from my blog. But follow us. Keep in touch. If you want to keep in touch, then this is what we do. My website is johndentontraining.com. My blog is dentonphotography.blogspot.com, dentonnudes.tumblr is the nudes blog, and my email address. If you've got any questions after today, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, I don't have an answering service. It is me, so if I take a little bit of time, I do apologise, but I am on, uh, on the road a heck of a lot, and it's not always that easy to find Wi-Fi. Um, if you do want any data colour products after today, feel free to use the code JDTRAIN314. That gets you 20% off all the products, and Rich is going to dive in in a minute and start talking um, in more detail about some of the products that can enhance your workflow and enhance your creativity. If you do want to come and meet me, then we do one-to-ones, we do workshops, we do mentoring, anything from a year-long program to um, hand-holding you through um, your early days in business. But the main event that we're looking forward to is a society's convention in London in 2016. I'll be down there for a full week, and I'm running four or five different shows, and we'll be around to answer questions and do all sorts of bits and pieces, and I'll pop up on the Data Colour stand, I'm sure, and come and say hello. We're also hoping to go to WPPI, so if you're in the States, um, come and see us in Vegas in March. But more than anything, this is a big, wide world of photography. So keep in touch. It's so great to share information. I absolutely love doing it. Okay. Rich, are you there, sure. my friend? I am indeed. Hello. Thanks, John. That was excellent. Well done. I mean, I, I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure loads of people uh, who are watching have done so as well. So let me just take the screen off of you, and I'll uh, I'll transfer over to myself. And uh, as you say, I'll wrap up with sort of a little bit of a, a bit more information on on some of the promotions we've got running, and also on uh, the data color side of things. So I'll just. Uh, pop into a, a, a couple of slides basically because obviously um, you, know, you mentioned during your session you know, there John that uh, you know you calibrate with a spider very important uh, part of what you're doing um, and, and obviously a key thing there is that it gives you the trust that you can look at your screen and you know that it's in a calibrated fashion so as you said you've got your laptop screen matched to your external screen you've then got that capability of being able to soft proof against where you're going to print images so that's all part of what we're doing with the the calibration solutions that uh, the data color have got now let's uh, let's just quickly have a look at the spider 5 because of course uh, this year we've launched the spider 5 this has happened uh, a couple of months ago now the spider 5 is the latest itera iteration obviously the fifth iteration if you didn't guess of the the spider screen calibrator so this is something that is aimed at calibrating Devices that emit lights are transmissive devices, so therefore laptop screens. Screens that are connected to laptops or desktop machines, iMacs, etc., etc. But even projectors, and with the Spider 5, we've now got 4K and 5K screens covered, and even curved screens as well. So, um, you know, pretty much the, the range of every type of screen that there is out there, TVs as well, a lot of people using TVs and video screens. And this can be, these can all be calibrated with the Spider. Very simple process, basically. So, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, used a, a Spider before, it's, it's a physical device, comes with software, Mac or PC based. In fact, nowadays you actually download the software, so you're always up to date with the latest software, provided you download the latest one. And it's a device that basically you, you plug into your computers that are driving the relevant screens you want to calibrate. And as you can see here on screen, it runs a bunch of color swatches in front of the optics on this device. Now the device knows, or the device reads those those uh, colors, and the software that it's tying into, that it's feeding back to, knows how those colors should appear in an international color consortium standard and, and, and effectively that is a consortium of all the major hardware and software manufacturers so Microsoft, Apple, 
uh, Adobe, um, all of the, the major screen manufacturers and all the major printer manufacturers as well all get together and, and set a standard for the, how colors should be seen basically, how they should appear. And that standard is what the spider calibrates your screens to. What essentially it does when you run it, it builds a fingerprint or a profile of your screens and it says, okay, well these are the colors that this screen can deliver, can show, and it knows what those colors should be, it knows what that gamut should be. So at the end of the process, and it only takes, you know, about five minutes on the first calibration or for, for some of the models a, a couple of minutes to recalibrate. But when you hit that save button at the end of the process, and you don't have, really have to do a great deal in there, it's just to uh, follow the guidelines and, and run the process. At the end of that basically, it essentially corrects your screen that you've been calibrating into this international standard. So you can look at it and you can trust what you're seeing. So as John said in his situation, he calibrates both his laptop and his, um, set his Acer screen that he has plugged into that. And because they've both got uh, similar color gamuts, essentially they're, they're identical once he's calibrated both of them because he's put them both into this international color standard. And the important thing is, for those of you who are printing images or sending images off to print, provided you're working with companies or printers that are calibrated, then effectively you can see, you can trust how those colors are going to come out. Now you do need to soft proof, so there's things we can talk about in other sessions, but in Lightroom, in the develop module, there's a little button marked soft proofing, and that allows you to see that soft proofing of those, those that work in the type of environments you're going to come out with. But that's uh, a bigger conversation. We're going to do another session on uh, the calibration devices, on the new Spider Studio, in fact, which, uh, which John mentioned, the Spider 5 Studio, came out on uh, Thursday, stroke Friday, depending on where you are, uh, last week. And uh, we'll be doing a session, I'll be doing a session on that on the 30th of September, so please come back for that if you want to find out more about screen calibration and print calibration as well. So hopefully that will give you uh, more of an understanding of, uh, of, of calibration on the screen and the output end. The key thing about the spiders, by the way, is that the, the version 5 has now been redesigned really to be a far more mobile device because we have a lot of photographers that are working on the move. You know, as you've seen with John, he's traveling to Ireland, he's traveling to, you know, to uh, hot and uh, nice places. And, uh, you know, for those of you who are doing wedding photography or any form of uh, events photography, pretty much any type of photography nowadays, what you should be doing if you're going to be showing your images to, to customers is going along and calibrating your screens, presumably most likely your laptop screen, once you're at your new venue, once you're in your new lighting conditions, every time you change your lighting conditions, you should be basically doing that recalibration so that we can see exactly what's, um, what's going on with your, your screens there. So, so basically, that gives you the opportunity at that point, you know, wherever you are, to be calibrated. And that's exactly what we've done with the Spider 5. We've said, OK, let's actually uh, build the 5 such that it's not just a studio-based device now. It's aimed at being mobile. It's got a lens cap built into the device. And that actually acts as a counterbalance when you're hanging your, your spider against your screen. It, it makes sure it hangs correctly on the screen in the right position. But more importantly, or equally importantly, it also protects that, that optics array when you're on the move. Now, formally, I don't think there's any device that's had that sort of um, thought put into it to make sure it's a much more robust device because also the optics and the sensors, as well as being improved to handle 4K and 5K screens, have also been encased in, uh, in encapsulated basically within the device. So they are more robust, so they're more bump resistant, so you can pull your, your spider in and out of your, your camera bag. It's a smaller device as well now, so they're easily uh, popped on screen and popped into your bag again. But every time you change location, recalibrate those screens just to trust that what you're seeing is then correct. And you can show your customers, show your friends or relatives, whoever it is, the correct colors and not give them a false impression. Obviously, that's most important when you're talking about commercial customers there. Uh, another thing about the, the spider is it's now tripod mountable as well, so if you are doing projectors, if you're doing larger screens, you can also tripod mount the device and uh, therefore calibrate on that fashion. And um, effectively, what we've done in particular with the, the Spider 5, and, and this is uh, something that uh, really allows people to get more out of lesser quality displays, we've put in a, um, 
the, on on the, uh, the the cutout uh, diagram here on the left hand side you'll see that there's a what appears to be sort of a, a mesh now that's actually a honeycomb style mesh over the optics of the uh, of the the spider and that's intended to channel light directly onto the sensor and that's particularly aimed at cutting down on lights that's coming in from the left and right and so on when you're when you're actually working on your screens that could make your your readings inaccurate basically and in particular, we, we've, it's improving results we're getting out of older screens and also things like IMAX where they've got quite a big thick glass front to that screen and therefore you get a lot of light bouncing around in from the sides there. So this really channels that light directly from the screen, which you're resting against, straight into the sensor. So it cuts down on anything coming from the sides. As a result, we're getting up to 55% more accurate readings on older displays and some of those lesser quality displays in particular. So it could be a really good way of reinvigorating some of those older screens for or for yourselves as well, rather than having to reinvest in, in a new screen. But you know, a good Adobe uh, RGB capable screen would always be a, a high recommendation there for working on. Uh, just so you're aware, there's three different types of spiders. Difference nowadays is that they are all the same physical chassis and there's just an upgrade between the different models. The Express is the entry level. Um, it, uh, it can nowadays do multiple displays with the same device. It, previously the Spider 4 Express couldn't but the Spider 5 can. Um, but it doesn't have certain things turned on. For instance the ambient light sensor, that's that little white dot you can see on the bat back of the, uh, the spider there. Particularly aimed at, uh, again, working when you're, when you're mobile, you need to check if you are in a new location, get that ambient lighting, that, uh, that the lighting of the, the environment you're in correct and that really helps. So in the Pro, that's the next one up and it's the one that most photographers would go for that ambient light sensor in particular is turned on and there's other um, elements enabled in there with the Pro but check out our website I won't go into too much details now and the Elite is the top of the range device and really that's aimed in particular at studios and, and graphic studios as well something where you really need to be able to match every one of your screens together to get them absolutely spot on and uh, that's uh, that's effectively what the Elite can do um, with the, the Pro, effectively, you won't be able to match screens of different gamuts. So if you've got something like an ISO display which shows a bigger gamut, then it will calibrate that and it will calibrate the colors of that display into the ICC standard. But if you're also working on, for instance, a laptop screen, which tend to be sRGB, which is 25% smaller in color, then you wouldn't want to match your displays in that instance because actually what you'd end up doing is you'd reduce down your color gamut of your um, larger Adobe RGB display into the reduced uh, level of your, your, your laptop. So really, as I say, the, the Elite tends to be used in studios where you have got a range of the same st type of monitor, maybe a, a lot of ISOs for instance, but you need them all to match exactly because every one of them will have its own nuances and its own differences of, of uh, color capabilities. So, so the, the spider is pretty much the uh, core element of your color calibration environment to make sure, as John said, that you've got on screen images that the colors you see you can trust uh, how they're going to come out, be that on the internet, on DVDs, or for instance uh, uh, to print provided you're soft proofing. Now, as I say, I'll cover off soft proofing on that webinar on the 30th of September. I'm going to quickly cover off um, one element that John touched on and that's capture calibration. Now we have a range of different uh, solutions for capture calibration but this gives you that little extra element that, uh, that John was mentioning about when you when you capture your images you, you need basically to, um, to be able to allow for differences in the lighting conditions you're in and effectively whilst the spider will calibrate your screens, for instance my, um, my desktop screens and my, my Cintiq there at step three in this scenario and I can trust what I'm seeing is correct. What it isn't necessarily going to do is make sure that what you've captured is what you saw at the time because there could be a whole bunch of lighting conditions that you're not capturing correctly in camera. So you need some frame of reference and we supply that in various different forms but things like our spider checker and our spider cube allow you to, uh, to 
do that calibration. Effectively, I'm just going to quickly cover off something with the, the spider checker. And I'll come out of the slide where I show you this live. Now, the good thing about this evening is you've seen some cracking photos from John. And now the more amusing thing is you're going to see some really lousy photos from me because I'm not a professional photographer. However, I do go to situations where calibration is required. And this, for instance, is one of my nephew's weddings where, yep, same guys, my nephews appearing in different lighting conditions and it looks like they're they effectively changed clothes because these different lighting conditions have caused these, you know, some of the shots to be really bleached out, washed out, some of the shots to have weird color casts on. So the question is how do we correct this? How do we capture it correctly in the first place? Well what we do is we shoot something called a spider checker and that was, you saw that uh, in the, the um, the shot there. I'll show you again uh, in, in the studio shot later on basically, but essentially it's a color chart with 48 colors on there and it allows you to set things like the correct exposure, the correct shadow detail, and also get those 48 colors calibrated again against a known standard because the spider checker comes again with Mac or PC software. You just need to shoot it and then basically do three simple things. Firstly, and I'm in Lightroom here in the develop module, uh, I'm going to go in and take out any overall color cast using my color picker. I'm just going to pull, press that into that particular square there. That's going to remove any overall color casts. I'm then going to check my highlight values here. So if you look underneath the histogram on the right hand side, you'll see it says 96.1, 96.1, 96.2. Now that is a 96% white, that particular square. So we know we're pretty much spot on. If it weren't correct, essentially your exposure is out. So you'd use the exposure slider in the software here to adjust that lighting to the right level to get the exposure correct. Now likewise, the only other square that you need to know is the, the black square directly down the bottom from there, which is a 4% black, basically, and, and that's near enough okay there. Basically, um, if it weren't spot on correct, I'd be using the blacks slider there to adjust that slightly, but uh, effectively, uh, you can see I've already adjusted that slightly to get it pretty much uh, a 4% black there. The core thing we've got here is actually an app, which you download or it comes with the, the spider checker, basically, and it gives you the opportunity to, to allow you to calibrate all the colors on that chart to check whether you've shot them correct or correctly. So therefore what I've done there is I've quickly um, done exactly what it says on the packet. I've, I've basically opened up that shot in the background there. The thing that I'm moving around now are the sample points. So all I'm going to do is just move those until they are inside each of one of those squares. And that's it. At this point, as soon as I hit the save calibration, it's going to create a, um, a, a calibration that is going to correct uh, my shots basically from there on in. So job done. Effectively, that pops up in Lightroom. In the case of Lightroom, it also works in other software like uh, Photoshop, um, for instance, in the, uh, the camera roll. It'll pop up here in the, the calibration area in the presets. So it's just a preset, it's just a little bit of metadata. But what it allows us to do is correct those shots. So essentially, if I go back to my not very good shots taken at this wedding, up in the, the area just above the, the user presets, I've actually grouped together a little folder of all the presets for this particular shot. So some of the shots in the church, some of the shots in the reception and so on. So these are just the correction factors because you need to shoot that guide in each particular environment. So here I'm in the church, let's correct that in the church shot, take out that color bias from that shot and correct the colors to get them spot on. Here I'm outside the church, so okay, let's actually click on outside the church and correct that color bias there. So again, taking the skin tones down so that they now match what was going on in the church basically, getting the jackets to look the same colors now basically. If I then go into the reception where we've really got a lousy color bias there, if I click on the inside reception cor uh, correction factor there, the preset, it's corrected those shots there. Hasn't done anything for my abilities with the camera. There's one of the guys has still got his eyes shut, so a bit of a pain from that point of view, but at least the colors are correct. And of course, for you guys um, who are doing this more commercially or certainly better than I am, you can see, I hope, how that's going to help correct your, your 
your color situations. Just to show you the, the spider checker itself, because it is a core product to really have at the front of your, your workflow, basically. It's, as you can see, it, it's about a double A5 size, but it does fold flat, so there's a hinge down the center where the young lady's holding it there. There's also a, um, a tripod mount at the bottom of that, so you can actually tripod mount and effectively, therefore, you don't need somebody to hold it. You can just go pop it into your lighting conditions, maybe before your models or your subjects have turned up, and capture the lighting conditions for those different situations, in my case, in the church, outside, etc., etc. So I'd go along with a tripod and just shot this once in each of those lighting conditions beforehand. And effectively, great device, upgradable. There's the, the cards are all individually printed uh, squares there, so therefore the, the colors are absolutely accurate. And you can uh, work in various different softwares with the, the plugins on both Mac and PC. Even check when, when the, the targets perhaps fade, but I have to say I've had mine for about three years, still not faded. And uh, there's two separate cards there, which both have got grey cards on the back. And this also means you can use it for video work as well as uh, photo work. In fact, the, the right-hand card within the, uh, the Spider Checker is also used in software like um, Blackmagic Resolve, DaVinci Resolve, basically, for color calibration of video as well. So a really useful device. Part of our range, as I say, of color calibration and calibration tools for the front end. But... As I say, come back to uh, to one of our other webinars or have a look at our pre-run webinars on our website uh, to see more about uh, any of these different options. So, a little um, something new. John mentioned we, we launched uh, last Thursday or Friday the Spider Studio, Spider 5 Studio. So, if you do want to have everything in the same box that is, uh, has got the spider in particular in there, spider elite, so the top of the range spider. It's got the cube, which is another one of the, these, these targets for removing color uh, casts and so on from your images. And it's also got the spider print, which allows you to calibrate your own printers and stock, so you can actually get to emulate, to soft proof your, your end result, your printed end result, basically. So that all comes in a box. This price in the UK is, is around £390 in fact. Now, that does represent a, a good saving compared to the, the individual constituent parts there because, for instance, the spider print is £290 roughly um, as, a, as a standard price. So you've got uh, uh, another, probably about a £50 to £60 saving in there. However, we have some promotions. Now, John already mentioned one. If you wanted to uh, get any of the, the data color equipment tonight to, uh, to go alongside your, your, uh, your apparatus, your, your kit, and you want to improve your life by getting displays that match, for instance, with a spider, or maybe calibrating your printers with a spider print, or perhaps calibrating that front end with the cube or the, uh, the spider checker, then if you go to our um, European store, so that's the, the URL down the bottom there, spider.datacolor.com forward slash orders, then uh, basically you can uh, buy from our European store in euros, and if you pop in at the end of the, the purchase process the code jdenton315, that's jdenton315, can't even read, 314, um, then you get a 20% discount off of our standard list pricing. So it's, it's a nice discount, and uh, hopefully that will uh, inspire you to, to rush in on, uh, uh, on improving your... Uh, your workflow, your, your color management. To give you an idea, this Spider 5 Studio, as I say, we, we've just launched it. Actually, that brings the cost down to 304 euros. Now, pricing is in euros, so if you are buying from the UK, it's going to be in euros, but actually, that works to your favor at the moment as well, which effectively brings that price of the, the Spider 5 Studio down to 223 pounds from 390. Now, 223 is X fat. The 390s ink fat, so some of that uh, difference there is VAT. But at the end of the day, if you are um, VAT registered, then you can pop in your VAT number as well on the, the spider site, the order site there, and actually get that removed at source. So you don't even have to worry about claiming back the VAT, basically. So hopefully that's going to be something that's going to be useful for you. Now, you've also heard John talk a lot about lighting tonight, and uh, our friends at uh, the Flash Center have put together a couple of different promotions, which we, we thought we'd share with you. Uh, one is, essentially, you can get a free reflector and grid set worth just under £50 there, um, plus uh, all... Uh, 
and all the portal light kits were. Well, that's with the the D light two and four and bricks uh, kits. The and also the the portal light kits. They also include a free, uh, unique to Alinchrom deflector worth twenty nine pounds there. So there's some good bundles. Again, promotions only until the end of September here from uh, from the Flash Center. And they also put together a, another. Um, uh, promotion around the Ellen Cron lights here for you, so they they, uh, they have 25% off the uh, essential EA, ELB accessories. So if you are looking for some accessories to your existing lighting setups, then now would be a good time to do it. So basically, um, give uh, give the guys at uh, the the Flash Center a call, and basically say you've been watching this webinar, and you, they'll give you details of uh, of the uh, the promotions there. Also, not only, and almost to finish up with, if you happen to decide to go for one of the delightful pieces of uh, data color kit through our, uh, our our orders site there, and is only through the European site that uh, John's code works, by the way, you can't use that in any other resellers, for instance, uh, then basically you can get um, a, up to 15% off the Adobe Creative Cloud Photography Plan, and that's the, the the, the uh, Creative Cloud bundle from Adobe that now comes with Lightroom and Photoshop amongst other elements in there like Behance and the mobile apps that they do. And uh, you get up to 15% uh, if you go to the URL down below and have your registration number for your, your newly purchased spider equipment in there. So that's www.datacolor.com forward slash Adobe 2015 dash UK. So, hopefully that's given you some ideas of how to save some money this evening. If you want to find out more, if you want to see um, how to, to work more of this kit, as I say, we'll be running another webinar on the 30th of uh, September. However, we do have a whole bunch of videos up on YouTube, so if you either search for Spider or if you go to YouTube and search for Next Tech, and make sure you get two T's in there, Next Tech. There's a whole bunch of uh, free training videos in there on how to use, for instance, there's uh, there's my good self um, showing how to use the spider cube and uh, the, uh, there's, there's a whole range of spider videos in there as well basically as well as some other review uh, of, of other uh, photographic kit basically. Uh, but not only but also you can also download a free 93 page guide to color management. If you haven't learned everything tonight and you, and you don't want to go to these videos you can always download it and read it at your own leisure. It is in German in this particular slide, but it also comes in English, French, and other languages. And very well written, very nicely written guide to uh, your color calibration. I have to say, because the spider's fairly new, the spider five is fairly new. I think the ebook e is still referring to the spider four. So, uh, so basically, uh, the technology, I, or rather, the underlying science is still the same, even if the, uh, the spider five is obviously greatly improved on the spider four. Uh, lastly, folks, if you have any questions, we're going to open the chat or the questions section in a second, but if you have any questions that um, we don't answer tonight, we don't have time to, because we are running a little bit over now, uh, then basically, the free phone number there, it is 20-800-700-870, that's the European free number, free phone number, hence the two zeros. Or our ticketing service via the, uh, the website allows you to pop in questions. Uh, onto uh, onto our, our illustrious team of technicians. So, uh, anything you need to know, drop us a line or give us a call. But uh, that's it from me, folks. I'm going to say thank you very much at this point. We're going to open up the the questions uh, section now. So, if you do have questions, then uh, we will dutifully answer as many as we can as quickly as we can. I can see we're already getting a lot of. Uh, Brilliant thanks, Johns, to John because he did do a cracking job tonight. And absolutely, thank you, John. It was uh, it was great to to, to to learn basically from you. So um, uh, that's uh, that's superb, mate. Well done. Um, so uh, for those of you out there, we will potentially be asking a few questions of yourself. But um, if you have questions, pop them in now. Um, I can see that uh, the usual questions of uh, will there be a a, a re um, re-showing of this, yes, the, the, the webinar will be popped onto our, uh, our website basically and you will have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to go and view that um, at your leisure on our website. So go to the same webinar site that you may well have signed into this evening and basically that gives you the opportunity to uh, uh, have a look at the, uh, the webinars that um, we've done in the past as well. So uh, 
Uh, looks like a lot of thank yous here, not too many questions as yet, so hopefully that's, uh, that's you've answered their questions already, John, in your very informative session, and maybe I've, I've answered a few of the colour management ones. Yeah, um, no worries. One thing on the um, promo code, I think yeah. you quoted as JDenton314. I thought mm. it was JDTrain314. We may Ooh. need to just check that. Right. We, um, we will indeed, yeah. I, I think... Um, if uh, if any questions, basically try both would be the answer. <laughs> so so you had JD Train three one four and I had J Denton three one four. Yeah, chances yeah. are I've probably just uh, got a, an old code there. So we'll we'll trust your one. But basically, folks, if, if you try either code, and basically you'll see in the in the last pane of the uh, um, the, uh, the the purchasing site there. That's where you can pop the code in, and that's where it will recalculate the amount that you'd be paying before you complete the, the purchase so try either one of those two codes and uh, and you should get your your um, discount applied so uh, I will, we'll try and uh, check that out and uh, if any follow-up emails go out we'll try and add that into it but of course you popped your email onto screen as well didn't you so therefore they can always drop you a line John and, and just just to double check with yourself or let you know if, if, if it hasn't worked and then you can come back to me absolutely no problem at all I shall be lurking around Facebook um, for another hour or so so if anybody wants to find me on there John Denton uh, Denton Photography just do a quick search on that you should be able to find me and yeah feel free to ask away I've thoroughly enjoyed it and thank you for the opportunity Rich yeah it was a great one tonight Johnny it was nice that uh, I think last time we had a little bit of uh, communications issues in <laughs> your end um, but uh, but that, that always adds to the fun from a presenter's point of view when I have to fill for a while uh, but uh, tonight that no, was superb it came came across beautifully and uh, as, as some of the, the comments on the the, uh, the site already uh, uh, have mentioned that uh, basically you know there was some